good afternoon friends welcome to the next edition of webinar i am dr barun kumar naik honorary general secretary of all india ophthalmological society now this webinars are getting very popular so at the same time i will request all those who are logging in and especially the pg students that if particular topics if they want to be discussed they can send me the feedback or their suggestions i will try to incorporate as far as possible those topics and also those who have missed out in the past or today's webinar or any time then it is all available on our website which can be any time can be uh, you can reach to that and download and uh, start listening to that but still i always prefer that listening when it is live has got different feeling all together and different concentration it is just like watching a movie in a picture hall <coughs> and sometimes that time you are fully concentrated about um, concentrated and uh, you are really concentration is so high that you really enjoy everything plus environment is also right for that so similarly this live webinar Uh, you will be i have always advise that live is always better because you are fully concentrating and also you can ask questions if you have any doubt but i can assure you any film which you watch on either uh, cd or uh, any other source you can never watch it in one go so that's the difference and that's the simile so always i prefer that one should take advantage of this live webinar every week which is being transmitted from all india ophthalmological society today's topic is very important swollen optic disc and uh, optic atrophy because these two conditions are such which is very common which we encountered as ophthalmologist but we are at a loss how to proceed about it to cover this topic today i have uh, called dr navin vijay kumar who is uh, earlier he was consultant in shankar netrale in neuro ophthalmology and he is one of the few neuro ophthalmologists of the country where you can really uh, you can uh, rely upon him and uh, now he is uh, practicing in a center which is uh, known as darshan eye center and he is director of darshan eye center so without wasting any time uh, i will now request dr navin jay kumar to take over and welcome dr navin thank you dr naik and uh, good afternoon to all my colleague ophthalmologists and students of ophthalmology uh, to this afternoon's webinar as dr naik had mentioned uh, we are talking two important uh, topics today one is uh, a swollen optic disc and the other is sometimes a natural outcome of a swollen optic disc which is a pale optic disc uh so these two as he mentioned are very common clinical conditions that we can encounter and which can quite often leave us puzzled and even today even after this discussion you may think everything is very clear but still when confronted with clinical situation it's not as easy as it seems so let me start uh today's uh, uh discussion of a swollen optic disc with uh, one particular question that i have put up in front of you that if you saw a swollen optic disc both eyes with normal vision uh, what would your plan be and uh, just a few broad guidelines i thought i'd mention that if you just step back and think about it if you see bilateral disc swelling with normal vision uh, apart from having diagnosed the condition itself if you are asked about the specific cause of this condition it's very difficult to make out a cause just by the appearance of the nerves uh, with the normal vision so inevitably uh, all these cases require investigations of some sort whether it is blood or whether it is neuroimaging etc um in case you find it difficult to come to a conclusion yourself no harm you can always refer it to a neuroophthalmologist or your local neurologist or if there's no one around try and work it up yourself there's a lot of material which is available which can guide you to this um one very important condition that you need to make a safe diagnosis of is idiopathic intracranial hypertension which is a not uncommon cause of bilateral swollen discs with normal vision and 
even more important than that, do not miss uh, the diagnosis of uh, intracranial space occupying lesions. These could be uh, life threatening as well, as well as conditions like dural venous sinus stenosis, etc. Um, so, coming to the common problem that we are faced with when we are confronted by slightly swollen or elevated optic discs is this very common question that is it papilledema or is it pseudopapilledema and then we try and go through the history and uh, examination findings and see which of these signs and symptoms that could help us in making this diagnosis. I have listed in front of you signs and symptoms that really will not contribute significantly to deciding whether a condition is papilledema or pseudopapilledema. I put the I put headaches here because although you might argue the fact that headaches is a sign of intracranial pressure raised ICP, I could also tell you headaches are most commonly due to stress and migraine which is the most common reasons for headaches. Likewise conditions like obesity or someone comes to you with some blurred vision, uh, someone comes to you with aura or photopsia, history of injuries, uh, pregnancy, these are all very soft signs. Uh, uh, as far as uh, helping us as to whether it is papilledema or not. But what can help you is if someone says they have pulsatile tinnitus, you have this whoosh sound in the ears coinciding with the pulse, that is significant. Likewise, headaches, for example, a patient wakes up in the mornings with severe headaches, these are signs of raised intracranial pressure. A patient who complains uh, of transient visual obscurations and by this I mean sudden loss of vision lasting a few seconds and not even a complete blackout. It's sometimes it's a very gross dimming of the vision and sometimes we call these as brownouts of vision. So transient visual obscurations, someone complaining of binocular diplopia, more for distance, a slight blurring or separation of images which uh, automatically looks clear when each eye is closed separately. These, this could be a sign of a sixth nerve palsy once again indicating raised ICP. I have also included refractive error there because you all know that significant hyperopia can also result in slightly elevated crowded looking discs um, and pseudopapilledema therefore. Family history is also important because sometimes you have drusen which are also familial and that might help you with the diagnosis as well. So let's get on after that little brief uh, introduction to the swollen optic disc. I thought I'd lay before you three terms with which we should be very clear. The first is pseudopapilledema, which you all know is a disc which appears swollen but is not really due to axonal swelling. On the other hand, you can have swelling of uh, the disc due to axonal swelling and this we call as true disc edema or optic disc edema is the word that you can use. But when we use the word optic disc edema, it could be edema due to any cause, whether it is a papillitis or an ischemic optic neuropathy or even a, pap or even a disc swelling due to raised intracranial pressure. But if someone told me, uh, Dr. Jayakumar, I have a case of papilledema, what I will assume at that point is you are telling me that the patient has bilateral disc swelling due to raised intracranial pressure. So that important distinction needs to be made. Uh, that papilledema is true disc swelling, it is a subset of optic disc edema, but that it is due to raised ICP. There are two clinical questions that we need to uh, ask ourselves when we come across uh, swollen optic discs. It is therefore the first question which we have been speaking about, is the disc really swollen? Essentially what it boils down to is, are you deciding is it, a papilla, is it a disc swelling or is it a pseudo disc swelling? And secondly, is the optic nerve function affected? So the first question is, is the disc really edematous? If it is yes, then you are dealing with a true disc swelling and true disc swelling can be due to an optic neuropathy of some kind or it can be due to papilledema. Uh, if it is not true disc swelling, it is a pseudo papilledema, uh, you have to decide whether it is a disc anomaly or a congenital disc anomaly or is it optic nerve hydrosin which might be the cause. So here is a photograph of a disc and I would like you to consider what are the features 
on this particular disk that might help you. So let me point out a few things on this disk. First of all, I think all of you might have noticed by now, this is a rather small looking optic disk. It's a small disk diameter. There's virtually no cup that is visible. All the vessels, the, the retinal arteries and the veins all arise from the center apex of the particular disc. That is one thing. What about this picture? I'd like you to look at the uh, one of the vessels uh, on the top here. You can see that that particular vessel goes away from the disc, makes a loop towards the disc and then travels out to the periphery. This is an anomalous loop. And anomalous loops are sometimes associated with congenital discs as well. Look carefully at the surface of the disc. The surface, the disc normally has very fine capillary networks which will be visible if you look at it with, a, say, a 90 diopter lens. Uh, so, in this case, for example, there's no superficial capillary telangiectasia or swelling of these surface network of uh, vessels. The surface of the disc is absolutely clean of hemorrhages, exudates, cotton wool spots. Take a look at the peripapillary area around the disc also. That's also very clean. It's a very pristine looking surface. Okay. What about this particular uh, disc which looks really swollen? Um, one might think that, well, this could be a papilledema or true disc swelling. But I'd like you to look at the blood vessels on the surface of this disc. I'm not talking about the very large vessels that you see, but even the smaller vessels uh, such as these, uh, tiny vessels, they, they are all very clearly visible on the surface of the disc. There is no obscuration or blurring of the blood vessels on the surface of this disc. They are all clearly visible. And that is one of those important clinical features that we looked for on a disc when trying to decide between papilledema and pseudopapilledema. Now this disc, many of you might have uh, come across in the course of your uh, clinical career. This disc is obviously an anomalous disc. It's grossly tilted. Uh, you can see the irregular disc margin. And temporal to that, you can see the peripapillary RPE is a lot of derangement there. So this by no stretch of imagination would one call this a true disc swelling. This is obviously a case of an uh, pseudo disc swelling. Even though in these cases, the nasal margin of the disc, which you can see here, would look a little elevated and the margins would be a little blurred. With this kind of irregular insertion of the optic uh, disc into the eye, optic nerve head into the eye, uh, clearly indicates that it is a tilted disc. This particular disc also shows elevated nasal margins. But if you look very closely at around the 9 o'clock position here, you might see two little lumps there. This I put an arrow to one. There's another one just above that here. And these are clearly visible drusen. So your diagnosis is made a lot easier for you. So if someone sent you this patient, you can heave a sigh of relief and say, okay, this is not true disc swelling. This is a pseudopapilledema due to visible drusen. The, this is a patient uh, who had hypoplastic discs and no perception of light in this case. And I'll give you one simple tip here which you can use for clinically looking at disc hypoplasia. If you remember, uh, uh, in, in as students, we used to be told that the, the fovea is about two and a half disc diameters away temporarily. So if we draw a circle around this particular optic disc and then transpose it across, you can see clearly that this fovea is not two and a half away, it's a little further beyond. It's almost close to three disc diameters. And the reason it's almost three disc diameters away is because this disc diameter is a small disc diameter. So it's a hypoplastic disc. So this is a very con convenient, rough rule of the thumb, clinical way of deciding uh, slightly hypoplastic discs. Okay. So to summarize the pictures that we've seen so far, Pseudopapilledema is characterized by small discs. The cup is usually small or absent. Uh, you can have anomalous branching of the blood vessels. Occasionally visible drusen can be seen. The margins of the disc are irregular. 
look at the peripapillary area, you may find RPE changes there, but you definitely won't find hemorrhages, exudates or cotton wool spots. So, I am going to present to you therefore now a patient of mine, 15 years old girl who presented with occasional headaches. So, as I told you the headache may not be a very significant thing, it may or may not be significant. So, let us take a look at the discs. Now, this, these are the photographs that I have put in front of you. In the right eye, it was relatively easy to pick out these uh, visible drusen there on the surface. So, I did not have too much difficulty there. But there is no rule that says that a patient with pseudo disc swelling or a drusen should not have papillary edema. Maybe she still has papillary edema on top of this. So, the question is what about this particular disc on the left side where there is really no visible drusen. So, how do we make a diagnosis of drusen if you are going to search for it. So, one simple way of checking drusen is you can take the patient straight from your consultation room to the ultrasound. You have a B scan and you put the patient on the B scan and what do you see? You see the red arrow there that shows a little calcific speck with a very high reflectivity very suggestive of an optic nerve head drusen, it is right on the optic nerve head. But what is more significant is if you reduce the gain of the ultrasound, the strength of the ultrasound waves, so all the other signals start to get depressed. Everything goes down as you can see on the pictures on your right except this, which is the calcific spot is so hyper reflective that even the lowest strength of the ultrasound gain even close to zero will still produce a spike confirming that it is a very high reflective probably calcium and therefore by inference probably an optic nerve head drusen as well. Um, talking of ultrasound sonography, suppose you saw a disc which looks like this. So, here is the optic nerve head uh, and you can see here that this optic nerve head is elevated here, but you do not see any high reflective spots. But on the other hand, you get some kind of a crescentic hypoechoic space here. This crescent sign is very typical of increased cerebrospinal fluid in the perioptic sheath. So, this patient does have true disc swelling or papilledema in this case. And another test of ultrasound which you can do if you suspect papilledema is uh, the 30 degree test. So, the, the picture on your left shows a B scan around the optic nerve. You can see this little bit of an elevation of the disc uh, head and then you see this large space here. That is the optic nerve and then you have this big gap there which is the widened subarachnoid space because of the fluid. And what happens next is if you ask the patient to tilt his eye say temporarily. Uh, by about 30 degrees, what this maneuver does is if the patient looks slightly outwards is it aligns the eyeball and the entire optic nerve, puts the optic nerve on stretch with the eyeball. So, this cerebrospinal fluid is dispersed along the entire optic nerve and the space that you saw becomes a lot narrower. Okay? So, you can get this narrowing of the subarachnoid space by performing this 30 degree tilt test which is again therefore characteristically seen in papilledema. CT scan is sometimes useful if you uh, as a patient can afford it and you are still suspecting a buried drusen somewhere. Here is a CT scan showing a very high hyper reflective uh, spot, a hyper dense spot sorry uh, over the optic nerve head very typical of a drusen as well. Uh, nowadays we have autofluorescence, you have excellent uh, uh, images of autofluorescence occurring on our uh, uh, spectral uh, spectralist machines, etc. So, here you can very clearly see these buried drusen uh, on the optic nerve head that confirms your diagnosis for you immediately. Lot of us have access to OCT and here are two pictures uh, of a disc swelling uh, uh, on the OCT. The, the picture on top, I would like you to look at the interior space of the optic disc and just follow the margin of the inside. Here you can see the margin inside of the sub uh, disc hypoechoic space is irregular. It has got this lumpy bumpy appearance and this is usually found in optic nerve head drusen. By contrast if you see the picture below 
This curvature is a smooth curve interior, more indicating of edema, which is a papal edema patient. And that's one little helpful sign that the OCT can give you uh, if you have access to the device. This is the spectral domain OCT uh, of a patient uh, with optic nerve at Drusen. You can see these three hyper-reflective uh, spaces inside the optic nerve head, very typical of Drusen. Um, another usefulness of the spectral domain OCT is in papilledema, where you look at the RPE Brooks membrane. Uh, if you look at the optic disc and the RPE Brooks membrane below it, normally the RPE Brooks membrane lies flat. In this case, because of the pushing of the uh, subarachnoid space of the fluid erase ICP, the RP Brooks membrane is tilted upwards, which is basically towards the vitreous. So you have this very positive angulation here, which you can see, and this is very typical. Here is the RP Brooks membrane, so we have drawn a horizontal line as to where it should normally be, and, and this line here shows where it is actually tilted up. So you have this kind of a V-shaped pattern uh, appearing on your drawing. So this is very typical uh, of uh, raised intracranial pressures. In fact, I can actually show you on the next slides here. In this picture, you can see the elevation here. It's up tilted here, similarly here. And after treatment with 8 weeks and 12 weeks, you can see how the RPE Brooks lining becomes absolutely horizontal. So you see this upward curve here, which slowly settles down as time goes by with the treatment. So this is actually a very useful way to follow up patients uh, with papal edema. So, uh, to summarize OCT findings in papal edema versus pseudopapal edema, you get RNFL thinning in pseudopapal edema, especially nasally. You can get a posteriorly bowed or a flat RP basin membrane, whereas in papal edema, the RP basin membrane is bowed towards the vitreous. Okay? We also can do the macular ganglion cell IPL in a plexiform layer. Uh, counts here you can get some loss or uh, thinning there uh, corresponding with visual field defects in Drusen and in, in papilledema it's a little lot of variable but more importantly you can see the bumpy lumpy inner contour in pseudopapilledema in papilledema it's a smooth inner contour and that will really help you with your diagnosis now let's go back to some more pictures of the fundus so but here um, something a little different number one you have a very dilated vessel, peripapillary. Number two, and very importantly, if you look at the disc vessels now, as opposed to the picture I showed you earlier, you can see that the vessels are obscured. And this obscuration of the surface disc vessels is because of axonal swelling, which is blurring the discs. Now, this one should leave you in no doubt. You have uh, dilated vessels on the surface. You have all the obscuration of vessels. And what about all those yellow patches on the disc, which is hard exudates? You get hemorrhages uh, over the disc and in the peripapillary area. So by no stretch of imagination is this pseudopapilledema. This is a true disc swelling. Okay. Here, uh, the disc looks swollen, but there is one finding that I'd like, you, like to highlight here, which will clearly point to only one diagnosis, which is papilledema or true disc swelling. And that is seen here. You can see these radial folds of the choroid in the peripapillary area corresponding to the curve of the disc. This is fluid extending from the disc into the peripapillary area, throwing the peripapillary area into folds and these folds are called Peyton's lines. So if you see Peyton's lines, definitely this is a true disc edema. You can see the Peyton's lines even in this photograph that I am showing you here. And along with that, you can see the little yellow dots, these are pseudodrusen, basically uh, similar to cotton wool spots appearing in the retina and uh, which brings us therefore to the second question. So the first one I asked you to decide whether it is look at the surface of the disc, look at the appearance of the disc and decide whether it is a true disc swelling or is it a pseudopapilledema. The second question I had for you was is the optic nerve function affected? In papilledema, the optic nerve function is usually preserved until very late in, in the natural course of papilledema when the optic nerve fibers start getting damaged because they are no longer able to function in such a raised high pressure environment, they start to die and that is when the visual loss starts to happen. 
conversely in optic neuropathy vision is usually affected right at the, right from the beginning and that should really help you the laterality is also important for virtually for all practical purposes please consider that papilledema is always a bilateral condition um, it may be asymmetric one disc may be more swollen than the other one but it will always be bilateral whereas in optic neuropathy uh, it may be bilateral but it quite commonly is also unilateral so if you see a unilateral disc swelling uh, definitely it is not papilledema or disc swelling due to raised ICP uh, there been a lot of discussion as to the cause of vision loss in papilledema etc and uh, one of the interesting reasons apart from nerve damage itself is the tracking of the fluid which you can see here uh, from the disc into the macular area seen beautifully in this OCT and after treatment and resolution of NAIO in this particular patient you can see in the lower picture that seven weeks later it has all gone down okay so uh, macular fluid can also be a reason for visual loss in NAI1 or even in papilledema patients. The spectrum uh, of disc swelling uh, ranges as you can see from the top you can get a if that was that was a patient with a unilateral disc swelling uh, with uh, a lot of visual impairment as a right at the beginning it's a case of papillitis and inflammation picture 2 clearly shows you disc swelling uh, with a macular an incomplete macular star or we can call this a macular fan uh, again this is not papilledema this is neuroretinitis the third photograph shows you not only disc swelling but also shows you a lot of choroiditis so this is a posterior uh, inflammation producing a disc swelling case 4 very very classic appearance you have upper part of the disc which is pale the lower half of the disc is edematous and hyperemic there is only one diagnosis for this which is non arthritic AION picture number 5 is interesting you see a swollen disc you see dilated vessels but you also see an anomalous vessel on the surface here this is an optico ciliary shunt and quite commonly seen in uh, optic nerve sheet meningiomas patient number 6 was an 80 year old gentleman who presented with bilateral with a unilateral visual loss his vision was only PL when he presented and you can see a completely white infarcted looking disc a pale disc acute pale disc swelling and not only that you have retinal edema which is extending to the macular area from the disc this is a senior retinal artery occlusion with an arthritic AIO and this patient had giant cell arthritis causing visual loss uh, picture number 7 is a patient with a disc swelling, macular edema as well the whole posterior pole looks a little swollen up and this is a patient who had a trabeculectomy you can see the trap there so obviously this is hypotony which can also cause disc swelling uh, patient number 8 the, this is a picture of his left eye and right eye um, clearly showing disc swelling but lot of hemorrhages uh, soft exudates, hard exudates, this is a hypertensive retinopathy uh, and this is one of the causes of bilateral disc swelling as well. Uh, papilledema can range, this is a picture over time you can see uh, ranging from mild disc swelling where it becomes very confusing, it goes over time more moderate and then you have all these retinal hemorrhages and exudates which develop bilaterally over time established then it goes into chronic disc swelling and then slowly the disc swelling goes down as the nerves, nerve fibers die and you get into uh, finally what is known as a secondary optic atrophy which is basically a blurred disc margins very pale looking disc uh, venous arteriola sheathing and these uh, watermarks around the disc indicating the previous disc swelling um, as far as MRI is concerned in papilledema here are some findings here you can see the peripapillary uh, perioptic space is widened you can see the white CSF there with the optic nerve running through it uh, you can see this in this coronal sections also so that's one of the features of papilledema due to raised ICP is widening of the perioptic spaces on CT scan you can sometimes see slit like ventricles because of cerebral edema that the ventricular space is narrowed uh, Another important thing to look at is look at this here in the central picture 
you can see the cellar tersica is virtually empty the pituitary is squashed right at the bottom of it this is an empty cellar which is also seen in raised intracranial pressure all these are signs of idiopathic intracranial hypertension one important test that you need to do in a patient with bilateral dispelling normal vision if you suspect papilledema is not only to order an mri of the brain but also an mr venogram and this is why uh, here is a picture of the venogram you can see the superior sagittal sinus which divides in the back of your head into the right and left transverse sinuses so you can see the normal left transverse sinus but see in the middle picture the right transverse sinus is either hypoplastic or stenotic that way and not only that the right sigmoid sinus is also very much narrowed right so dural venous sinus stenosis is quite commonly associated uh, with idiopathic intracranial hypertension that way what happens uh, if you have bilateral apologies for the spelling mistake there bilateral optic disc edema but not papilledema in other words you have both eyes the disc is really swollen but the optic nerve function is normal and someone has checked the raised intracranial pressure and that is also found to be normal and this leads us to the one of the most important things that you do when you see a patient with bilateral disc swelling in such a situation is ask for the blood pressure i'm not talking of high bp say 140 100 i'm talking about conditions where the blood pressure may be as high as 200 plus uh, over 100 110 so these patients with malignant hypertension uh can have such present with such a situation you'll be doing the patient a real favor these are patients who are the risk of who are at risk of possibly even dropping dead in front of you so they should go immediately and get admitted into an intensive care and get managed to bring down the bp cyanotic congenital heart disease the list is here sleep apnea associated spinal cord tumors there's no tumor in the head it's lower down but the pressures are raised overall because it's all one single compartment the guillain barre syndrome uremia don't forget anemia here uh, i have had couple of patients who had hemoglobins as low as about 4 or 5 presenting with bilateral disc swelling and once you treat the anemia they automatically got better optic perineuritis where you have inflammation of the surface such as in sarcoidosis or syphilis can present with a swollen disc but normal optic nerve function so uh, in conclusion this is how i would look at for a bilateral optic disc edema is to decide whether it is a true edema or a pseudo papilledema if it is a true edema ask yourself whether the patient has visual loss is the patient having an optic neuropathy investigate accordingly check optic nerve function and if you find signs of optic nerve dysfunction in true edema it's most likely an optic neuropathy and you manage it as such but suppose there is no visual loss and the optic nerve function is normal then you have to do an mri to look for a structural lesion are you looking for a tumor or a posterior fossa tumor etc so uh, do an mri look for a tumor but if you do find something there then you are sure that what you are dealing with is a papilledema on the other hand suppose there is no tumor in the brain then you have to do a lumbar puncture confirm the existence of raised intracranial pressure which will tell you that this is papilledema but occasionally if the lp comes out the csf pressure is normal then you are left with other conditions that is hypertensive uh, causes or the guillain barre syndrome etc 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 so uh, to conclude sometimes it's very difficult to tell pseudo papilledema and papilledema apart so please don't feel disheartened but do follow the steps and try and arrive at some kind of conclusion uh, symptoms can be helpful ask about specific indicators for raised icp a careful examination with attention to the optic disc and its vasculature is paramount in deciding what you're dealing with then you perform ancillary tests look for optic disc drusen and disc elevation mri can be useful to look for other signs of high icp as i showed you on those photographs and whenever in doubt uh, follow these patients over time have frequent eye examinations follow these discs over time do repeat octs and fields and make sure that uh the patient is okay and so that you do, you may come to a diagnosis later on uh two points i'd like to leave you with in india many times our neurologists neurology colleagues uh may just say that the pressure is raised but they'll never measure the opening pressure it's a very very simple test to do all you need to do is to connect a manometer to the lp needle uh this picture 
is taken in Uganda. So if Uganda can do it, I'm sure India can do it as well. The second thing is, which you can do yourself, is please measure the blood pressure in all these patients. It's easy to forget to do that in your excitement at having picked up a papilla edema. Thank you very much. So uh, we move on right away to my uh, second talk, which is evaluation of a pale optic disc. So we spoke about uh, swollen discs, so now we've gone on to the next step, which is the pale optic disc. So here again, I have a question to pose for you, is normally when someone refers a patient to us and saying, uh, Dr. Jayakumar, can you please examine this patient? The disc looks a little pale. So, or someone sends you a photograph by email saying, uh, I have a patient with bilateral disc pallor. So, always the first question I ask myself is, unless it's very, very obvious, is the pallor for real? And so, it leads us to the question as to what causes the pallor in the first case? So I have two intriguing photographs. One picture is very easy for you, which is basically the disc itself, uh, a closed surface appearance of the disc. You can see all the little vessels on the surface. But the other is a fiber optic cable. So question is, what is the fiber optic cable doing in this slide? So this is why. Our fiber optic cable are, is similar to the axons over our optic nerve head. and um, there is a loss of total internal reflection in these degenerating axons and therefore normally what would happen is because of total internal reflection uh, you don't really see the pallor because you have these uh, capillaries on the disc surface which make the disc look pink but if the axons get damaged then there's loss of total internal reflection and then light gets reflected back from the axons themselves and the nerve looks pale. And apart from that, if there is damage to axons, there is also consequently loss of capillaries on the disc surface. So these are two reasons why uh, discs start to look pale when the optic nerve gets damaged. Okay. So what are the so-called temporal pallor in inverted commas, non-pathological causes? All of you have seen uh, high myopia patients. And many of these high myopia patients have a temporal side of the disc that looks a little pale compared to the nasal side of the disc. Likewise, myelinated nerve fibers may cause appearance of pallor. Uh, disc anomalies like optic nerve pits or tilted discs, optic nerve hypoplasia, scleral crescents and drusens. So all these pseudo papilledema like conditions also produce a little bit of temporal pallor as well. So, Ophthalmoscopically also, if you, you all know that if you raise, if you see photographs which is a little overexposed, the disc looks very white. Okay. So, <coughs> I put there for you the brightness of the direct and indirect ophthalmoscopes because any disc will appear a little pale if the luminosity of the in instrument is brighter than normal. So, keep a watch on your instrument as well. Are you examining the disc correctly? So, what is finally optic atrophy? Now, this is a word in the previous talk, I specifically used the term, we used the term papilledema to refer to disc swellings due to raised ICP. So when someone tells me in this case, like I have a patient with optic atrophy, I am going to me, uh, assume that you are telling me that you have a patient whose disc has become pale, plus there is signs of optic nerve dysfunction. The disc is not functioning well and that's an important uh, point to make here. So, what are the tests of optic nerve function that you can do right away in your consultation room? You can do your visual fields, uh, confrontation or you can take the patient to a field machine. Visual acuity, pupil, color vision. So, remember color vision, pupil and fields. Three things at least you should be able to do, okay, if not the others. There are certain other things if you have access to, you can do contrast sensitivity. You can measure the nerve fiber thickness uh, on OCT. And if you have access to uh, visual electrophysiology, you can even do a VEP or a pattern ERG to decide whether the ganglion cells are working fine or not. So, uh, when we see optic atrophy, uh, two questions automatically arise. You see this disc here, it's looking pale. 
question one why is this disc pain is the patient have an injury is this, is this uh, is it glaucoma did he have an optic neuritis in the past is there some tumor sitting inside his head producing this pain so why and secondly where is this uh, optic atrophy originating from is it on the disc head itself or is the cause retrobulbar is it in the orbital optic nerve in the canal in the chiasm in the uh, optic tract well all the way where does this nerve go all the way to the lateral geniculate body so any damage to this particular nerve will produce disc pallor so why and where are the two questions that we need to look at we are all familiar from our textbooks from uh, medical college and ophthalmology residencies that the classification of optic atrophy is primary secondary consecutive uh, uh, and say glaucomatous for example so uh, you may be wondering why are we going on and on about this i think it's important because these this particular classification tells you what kind of optic atrophy it is for example this is a disc which is looking pale whose margins are quite sharp Uh, whose uh, vessels are kind of all looking all right maybe a little thinning uh, peripapillary area looks absolutely fine nothing else wrong so this is very very typical of some pathology that is affecting this optic nerve behind the eye some retrobulbar process if you ask me what retrobulbar process is it infection inflammation uh, trauma uh, infiltrative i don't know but i all i do know is that it is happening behind the globe and this is primary optic atrophy a chalky white disc sharp margins retinal vessels which may look normal or slightly attenuated a lamina fibrosa which is quite well seen and a rather shallow cup as opposed to a glaucomatous cupping for example here i would like to uh, mention some things that are useful is if you actually look at normal optic disc the margin of the disc is never sh absolutely sharp it's slightly fuzzy and the reason it's slightly fuzzy is what is the margin of the disc is basically the scleral opening but over that you have these millions of nerve fibers which are leaving it so you are seeing the edge of the scleral cup beneath a thick lie layer of nerve axons and that produces that slight blur it's not completely blurred so we use the word well defined to describe a normal disc margin whereas if all those overlying axons were lost the margin of the disc therefore is the scleral edge is seen in a much more sharper way so when you see a sharp margin it usually denotes that loss of axons have happened so what are the causes of primary optic atrophy as i told you there are different pathologies but they all retrobulbar in location so whether it's a pituitary tumor or an optic nerve glioma or a meningioma traumatic optic neuropathy ms retrobulbar neuritis all of them produce the same appearance that way so here is a picture again another set of uh, optic disc but something very different here the discs are looking very pale but if you look closely the margins are blurred you can see these watermarks around the disc um uh, you can also see uh, some amount of sheathing of these vessels here okay you can see the gliosis extending so what is this meaning of this this is a disc that was once upon a time atrophic uh, sorry edematous it was disc swelling leading on to atrophy so this kind of optic atrophy is called secondary optic atrophy it is secondary to what it is secondary to optic disc swelling so this is a dirty gray looking disc as i told you the margins poorly defined the lamina fibrosa is filled up with gliosis uh, highland body you get pseudo drusen because of all the damage to the uh, myelin sheath and peripapillary sheathing of the arteries and you get tortuous vein so this is a very typical looking picture so what is the cause it's secondary to optic disc edema whether it is papillary edema or papillitis we don't know you have to ask the history and find some other way to come to this conclusion so the appearance in secondary optic atrophy is due to a marked degeneration of optic nerve fibers this excessive glial tissue proliferation which is why it spreads over to the vessels 
peripatory and the architecture is lost in this indistinct margin. Many of you might have seen a disk looking like this and quite often when you see a disk like this you say oh I know what the diagnosis is and it's so typical this is like one yellow moon like pallor of the disc and the arterioles are so thinned out you can barely see it and you can see on the left hand side uh, the entire retinal area is looking rather greyish lot of RPE changes you can't miss this particular diagnosis this retinitis pigmentosa so this is a disc that has become pale whose ganglion cells have been damaged because of disease in the retina or in the choroid. So damage due to chorioretinal disease produces this kind of pallor, a kind of a waxy pale disc, normal margins, normal cap and lot of attenuation of the vessels and commonly due to conditions like retinitis pigmentosa or central retinal artery occlusion, myopia, etc. Well, I needn't uh, uh, bother you with this. All of you know this quite well. I just wanted to tell you that glaucoma is a kind of optic neuropathy as well. So please do keep that in mind. Uh, and I, the, the appearance of the disc is very, very clear. You have this, the, the, the marked thing is the cupping that you need to see. Uh, whereas in optic atrophy, it's more of the pallor that is there. So it's a very favorite thing in, in multi-speciality ophthalmic centers that uh, if it's uh, cupping more than pallor, you send it to the glaucoma specialist. And if it's pallor more than cupping, it goes to the neuro-ophthalmologist. Okay. So um, this is an interesting uh, case of a patient uh, we saw in 2007. And you can see here that the upper half of the disc is a little pale and the lower half still preserves some amount uh, of um, uh, pinkness to it. Looks relatively normal. And this patient had an altitudinal field defect. So this is very typical of a non-arthritic AION actually due to diabetes and because this patient had diabetes uh, the retina specialist took serial photographs of this patient and you can see the same eye and the same disc as to how it was in 2004 and I'd like to highlight one thing here that you have a disc which is a little small because as you can see the cup is virtually absent in this disc this is a typical disc at risk uh, this is a term that is used to describe uh, structurally susceptible discs to non-arthritic AION. So if you see a smallish looking disc, it is at risk of developing any AION. And this is in 2004. In 2006, the same disc you can see swollen up in the acute phase of any AION, leading one year later to this particular uh, appearance that you see. So this is a rare kind sort of series of pictures uh, of an ensuing any AION. This is a disc swelling. It's an, a pale looking disc. This is an acute pallor. This is not the pallor that arises in retrobulbar neuritis, which takes about six weeks for it to reach the optic disc and then it will starts to look pale. Um, this is a pallor that happens immediately that's because this disc is infarcted. This is, a non -art uh, this is an arthritic AION and you can see the celio -ret uh, retinal uh, occlusion as well. You remember that the celio retinal artery arises from the posterior ciliary circulation. This is the same circulation that also supplies the optic nerve head resulting in both these things happening together. This is the famous temporal pallor that I've been talking to you about. But here in this patient, it's quite obvious that the disc is pale temporally. And whenever I see temporal pallor with, remember this is important, with signs of optic nerve uh, dysfunction. So, vision is a little lowered, there are visual field defects, color vision is low, four conditions that you need to think of. Okay, let me go to that. So this is what this I mentioned, real temporal pallor, pallor plus signs of optic nerve dysfunction. Four things that you need to remember, toxic, nutritional, <coughs> cone dystrophies and the hereditary optic atrophies including labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. I think 99% of all the temporal pallors pathological temporal pallors will fit into one of these four categories. Uh, optic atrophy can also happen in young persons. It happens in three clinical settings. One is in conditions like adreno uh, dystrophy. You get optic atrophy with white matter disease. You see it on the MRI, you will get patches in the brain. Um, you can have optic atrophy with other systemic features. 
these are usually associated with the optic atrophy 1 gene mutation uh, and occasionally you get isolated optic atrophy which could be either autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive or it could be the mitochondrial variety which is labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. Uh, I am going to end this talk with an interesting case which I think is illustrative of our approach. You may be wondering what this picture is. So this is a 25 year old male who came from Iraq uh, with a head trauma 2 years ago followed by visual loss in the right eye. Um, on examination his right eye had no perception of light. There was a scar over the right side lateral eyebrow there indicating uh, injury. The right pupil was non-reactive with a gross RAPD. My question is this is the photograph. You can see the paleness here of the right optic. It is completely atrophic. That is the left eye optic nerve. So my question is this. Is this is 2 years old. Would you do neuroimaging for this patient who has apparently traumatic optic neuropathy now? And the answer is probably no. Uh, this is a patient who was referred by an ophthalmologist colleague of mine. Uh, he just saw it as optic atrophy and decided optic atrophy is equal to neuroimaging. So he actually did an MRI just in case. And this is the just in case MRI which was done. And you can see this huge tumor inside the brain over the chiasm. This is a pituitary. What happened? So the audio is also disconnected? Yeah. So uh, my colleague performed an MRI for this patient and you can see here a very large pituitary tumor which is stretching the optic nerve chiasm on the top here producing the optic atrophy. You can even see this uh, hypo uh, intense areas indicating hemorrhage inside the pituitary tumor some kind of a pituitary apoplexy. So this was the diagnosis and the cause and not trauma. So uh, when he came to me, he came to me with all these things and the MRI. So I was asking myself one question which I think you should ask yourself is, would you, would I have missed this patient because it was an old case of traumatic optic atrophy. So I said let me just start from because that is the, my biggest concern that I may not have done an MRI two years later for an old traumatic optic atrophy and ended up with the patient having a brain tumor. So. I went through the history again and this is what the patient said. I said what exactly happened at that time? 
So he, he said, you know, how it is in Iraq and people, the Americans pull out people for questioning and sometimes they get beaten up and I was hit on the head repeatedly by these American soldiers and after that my vision slowly went down over six months, I lost my sight. I said, aha. I said, that's an important red flag there. What did you say? Say that again. And this is what he said. Eyesight was lost gradually over six months. So gradual onset progressive optic neuropathy obviously cannot be due to trauma. And that itself should tell you that any optic atrophy which is progressively increasing or vision is progressively getting lost, gradual onset progressive is a compressive lesion. So lesson number one, history sometimes they say is not everything. And quite often it is the only thing that may help you in diagnosis as in this case. I examined the patient again. Let me just show you this picture. So this is the, um, you can see the uh, right optic atrophy, very, very clear. And this is a seemingly normal disc, which is reportedly normal. But let's take a closer look at the left optic disc. What do you see here? You see temporal pallor, which is here. But you also see nasal side pallor as well. So the shape of this is a bow tie and this is the typical bow tie optrophy which happens in thiazmal lesions. Okay? So what should your game plan be in optic atrophy? First rule out non-pathologic temporal pallor. Take a careful history and examination. You know how important history is. Classify the optic atrophy according to its appearance ophthalmoscopically. Is it primary, secondary, uh, is it consecutive? What is it? Review your history. You've finished your examination. You may have certain questions to go back and ask the patient. Maybe a little more relevant history needs to be taken. Please review the history. Uh, come to some kind of clinical diagnosis or differentials. Then consider investigations, uh, whether it's optic nerve structure, such as OCT, fundus photography, or is it optic nerve function, that is visual fields, etc. Perform neuroimaging when appropriate including lab investigations which are directed. There is no need to do a shotgun approach to everything. And my last couple of slides is, uh, it's a little more uh, philosophical question. Is Most of us consider optic atrophy and you say nothing can be done for the vision. Okay, But maybe you can do certain other things. Just look a little bit beyond the pallor. Francis Bacon, who is uh, described as the father of the scientific method, at that time, this, this was in the 16th century, he said, what is the function of medicine? It is one, to preserve health, two, to find cures of disease, and essentially to prolong life. And this was about 500 years ago. So I kind of translated this into this particular situation as how would we preserve the health of the eye or the optic nerve? Is there any way you can improve the patient's uh, quality of vision? It may be visual rehabilitation, it may be using low vision aids, uh, importantly, preventing further visual loss. Is it a recurrent optic neuropathy? Can the patient lose some more vision? Uh, is it a progressive optic neuropathy? Will it go down over time? And what is the risk to the fellow eye? These are things that you need to consider and not just throw up your hands because of, of you saw a pale disc. Is there any cure for optic atrophy? Not right now, but there's a lot of work as you know going on in optic nerve regeneration. And importantly, many causes of optic atrophy are due to systemic diseases which not only may be sight-threatening such as giant cell arthritis, but may also be life-threatening as in giant cell arthritis. Uh, diabetes, you all know what a threat that is as well. So appropriate referral uh, to your fellow uh, colleagues in medicine is important. And do consider uh, examining the family in case you are dealing with genetic or familiar diseases. And with that, I come to the conclusion. Thank you all very much. We will take uh, questions now. So, um, I have a question uh, by uh, M. Lakshmi, who has asked, um, treatment for idiopathic intracranial hypertension with dural sinus thrombosis. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, is always a query and it's a kind of a neurology question really because we don't really treat dural sinus thrombosis but in a short line I can tell you there's a usually a discussion between stenting and of course using thrombolytics as well. Uh, but that's something for the neurologist to do. What question, what can you do? I think you need to treat 
the disc edema and the quick way to do that is to uh, use Dimox carbonic anhydrase inhibitors essentially try and bring down the intracranial pressure. Essentially we consider IIH uh, to be a kind of a glaucoma of the central nervous system. Dimox works well in glaucoma, Dimox works well in IIH as well. So do treat the patient but this needs a referral to the, uh, uh, to the um, uh, neurology or neurosurgery colleague. Keep in mind the possibility that these patients may need, uh, if your job is also to follow up the vision and uh, optic nerve function over time, is, is the patient maintaining visual function, is there any further deterioration in, 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 in optic nerve function uh, because if that is the case then you need to do some form of decompression. Uh, either optic nerve sheath decompression or even if necessary an LP shunt. Uh, my next question, um, uh, Kalpana how to differentiate temporal sloping rims versus temporal pallor? Uh, well, I would not really worry too much about the difference between the two uh, Kalpana except I would probably say the more important question as I mentioned is that is it a normal nerve in terms of its function or not because if it is an abnormal field with a pallor then you need to investigate if it is a normal field normal color vision etc with a little bit of a temporal pallor it really does not matter. Um, there are certain other questions uh, let me just see. Uh, Someone has asked, um, should we? Uh, no, just, just I'll ask uh, the technical person. Who has yeah. Someone has commented, unable to see any disc pictures. Why? Why is it so? Can you tell why? Because some of them, most of them, have seen it. So someone has not seen it any particular reason. Yeah, because hmm. what what he is telling that we have been also simultaneously viewing on the side, and we are able to see everything view. So I. Okay. Oh, because any not unable, unable to see any disc pictures, it means there must be some major problem in the internet connection. So another med, uh, question has been asked is about unilateral disc edema with macular star. Unilateral disc edema with macular star is usually not a papal edema that is raised ICP, uh, except when we are dealing with a very very late stage ICPs, you might find a little bit of macular heart heart deficits or very severe papal edema. But if you see disc edema, especially unilateral with macular star, treat or manage it as you would manage a posterior uveitis. So you all know what the investigations of posterior uveitis or choroiditis is. Think of the infections, tuberculosis, sarcoid, syphilis. Think of the uh, inflammatory conditions, your ANA, SLE uh, situation. Think of viral diseases. So the it is the same management and line of approach that you would approach a, a say a choroiditis for example. So uh, can any ION present with a large hemorrhage over the disc? That is a little unusual for me. Uh, any ION does occasionally present with splinter hemorrhages uh, which can happen but if you see a very large hemorrhage that is usually not any ION. Sometimes optic nerve head drusens. Uh, can have a subretinal neovascular vessel on it and that can sometimes bleed with a very large uh, kind of a hemorrhage on the surface and sometimes drusens may be associated with some kind of an ischemic optic neuropathy very very unlikely but large hemorrhages on the disc I would not really think of NAION as the, as the first uh, option really. There is one question which has mm. come from Dr. Bhaskar Rajan, is it possible to reverse the field defects due to optic atrophy? Well, uh, I think we need to ask ourselves is it can we re can we reverse uh, optic neuropathy because optic atrophy is a structural appearance of the disc. It does not a pale disc uh, can have a 6-6 vision, a pale disc can also have an N no PL vision. So, I do not think you should be able to correlate extent of visual acuity with the extent of paleness of the optic disc. So 
I would look at it more as to what is the underlying cause. If you're dealing with some kind of optic neuropathy, is the is the field effect correlating with the optic neuropathy? Yes, it will correlate, and then depends on the kind of optic neuropathy you're dealing with to decide whether if it is a uh, uh, optic neuritis and you treat it with steroids, yes, field effects will get better over time. If you had a if you had a patient with optic neuritis in the past, the disc has become a little pale, and now he's again developed a vision problem. There's a recurrent optic neuritis. Again, you treat with steroids. Again, the visual acuity will improve. Uh, and the uh, recent field effects which now develop will reverse to some extent. So yes, it will change. But uh, I don't think you can connect the degree of pallor of the optic uh, disc with the extent of vision. So one question I have to ask. Yes, sir. That in benign intracranial hypertension, mm. it is said that if the patient is obese, then definitely by weight reduction, Absolutely. it does it does help. It really, really helps really helps. Unfortunately, it's very easy for us to tell patients to reduce weight and patients do make an effort but it is quite difficult for them and many of them uh, have associated thyroid disease which makes it even more difficult for them to uh, lose weight but what has been clearly established is weight loss does result in reduction of ICP. And, uh, and what stage you would suggest that patients should undergo shunt operation or well, uh, the, the question we normally would get asked is now, sometimes people ask me is when do you do optic nerve sheath defenestration, defenestration yeah. and when do you do a shunt. So let us go one step before that and ask when do we even think about these procedures. Uh, when does medical treatment stop and surgical treatment start to get considered. I think um, if a patient is already losing vision. Uh, you don't have, you are already on that very slippery down slope of going down all the way to NPL. You don't have much time for medical treatment to work. You may have to consider surgical treatments fast. However, if you have a patient with an uh, papal edema, the optic nerve function is reasonably okay. We normally put them on medical treatment. For many reasons, medical treatment may either be ineffective, resulting in as you are following up the patient over time you see deteriorating visual fields or many patients are unable to tolerate high doses of diamox for example they don't take the treatment properly or the condition is such that the treatment itself doesn't work and you find deteriorating visual function optic nerve function then you are left with no other option which brings us to the question as to do you do optic nerve sheet defenestration or do we refer it to our colleagues to do an LP shunt and the way to answer that is consider the other symptoms. Uh, if we have only visual symptoms without other uh, CNS symptoms such as a headache, uh, warm nausea, vomiting and these kinds of things, it's purely visual then optic nerve sheet fenestration is sufficient. Whereas if you have CNS function uh, symptoms plus vision issues then the LP shunt works better. And I believe it's always there is a kind of fear in ophthalmologist mind about optic nerve defenestration. Mm. But uh, it's probably it's a very simple procedure if it is done properly. It has to be done properly, yes. yes. And uh, it, 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 there is a little bit of a learning curve in it and uh, that is why many of us are not very familiar with it. We send it to our colleagues in ENT or uh, uh, people comfortable in doing transnasal fenestrations are able to do that. Uh, but there are people who are very good at it, but it has to be careful. But having said that, it is easier to do uh, optic nerve sheet fenestration in papal edema patients because the disc, the nerve sheet is it's so quite far swollen away. Yeah. that uh, you, your, your optic nerve is reasonably far away from your knife. So, uh, so it's easy to make that slit and open it up. Not too difficult. Someone has asked whether I could speak louder. I hope uh, the volume of my voice has increased and you can all hear me. Um, I, someone had mentioned that they're unable to see any disc pictures. Yeah, I yeah, apologize yeah. for that. We try and figure out why that is so. Uh, someone has asked about uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension in young patients. In young patients, please remember two things. Uh, tumors important to rule out not only in the brain and the spinal cord 
and number two infectious diseases producing raised ICP. Uh, so you have to be very very careful in the pediatric population about infections uh, and uh, I think liaising with a, with a pediatric neurologist is I think critical in these cases to avoid burning your fingers. I think you should stick to making the diagnosis and following up and helping the neurologist via your examinations of the disc to give them that input as well. Someone has talked about pseudophagic pallor versus true pallor. Again, as I mentioned, always don't worry about the term pallor. I want to know, uh, I want to know the optic nerve function. I want to know color vision. I want to know pupils. I want to know fields. If all these are fine, you can just safely ignore the pallor. Yes, someone asked a lost connection between the things of temporal pallor. Uh, the four with optic nerve dysfunction, what are the things you think of? Toxic, uh, nutritional, by nutritional, I mean the toxic nutritional is the alcohol, the tobacco, drugs, ethambutol, etc., etc. Uh, vitamin B1 and B12, all of you know, is very important. Okay. Cone dystrophies, cone dystrophies because of damage to the cones produces the temporal pallor, and of course, the uh, hereditary or the genetic causes of optic atrophy, which is a uh, dominant optic atrophy or even LHON. So these are things which would result in temporal pallor of the discs. So toxic, nutritional um, uh, and the genetic and cone dystrophy. These are the four things one would think of. That was Dr. Chintan who had asked this question. And today's topic basically we have not purposely discussed the treatment aspect because that thing would yeah. have not been possible to cover in this yeah. limited period I of one hour. I focused primarily on the way we can approach it clinically that allows you to reach a particular okay. diagnosis yes, and then right. take off from there. Yes, so, so but don't worry, I am sure once in future we are going to keep one topic where this treatment of these conditions, especially the optic neuritis. Yes, the each of these can be explored yes, later it can, on. Yes, yes. Yeah. That, that is yeah. going to be covered. Yes. But just in brief, I want to ask one question. Yes, sir. That how to differentiate between, because partly you mentioned that, mm. the non-arthritic optic neuropathy mm. and ischemic, I mean arthritic ischemic optic neuropathy. Mm. Um, what I would do is, uh, if you saw, um, it, we could go about it the conventional way and, and look at it as, as a patient with acute painless visual loss with, uh, with a disc swelling which is looking a little pale. So pallid disc edema with acute loss of vision occurring in a, in a patient say over 40. So generally uh, non-arthritic uh, AIONs would be associated with conditions like diabetes, hypertension, etc. Arthritic AIONs usually occur in the 60 plus age groups. Uh, but the important thing is uh, if you look at the, the seriousness is uh, arthritic AION is the one I would have red flags all over because you can do something to save vision in the other eye of these patients and you have to act quickly because the other eye can be lost even in a matter of hours to days. So you don't really have much of a time window in which to work. So very quickly a patient comes like this, what would I ask is do you have uh, is there a pain or swelling of the temporal artery there? What about the appearance of the disc? The disc appearance is usually a very pale, infarcted looking disc is usually arthritic. Uh, if you see a disc which is a little pale on top and hyperemic below, that is very typically non-arthritic. Uh, just see a hyperemic looking swollen disc, may either be this or that. Uh, remember to ask for other signs of giant cell arthritis. Lot of them have got uh, jaw claudication, lot of them have a little bit of a fever in the evenings, recent weight loss, uh, all these are symptoms which may be present. Um, I do, I always ask my PGs, what is the one thing that you would do if you suspected this, right then and there, go and get the blood drawn, half an hour later just tell me what the ESR is. Okay. ESRs which are sky high, like 50, 60. Uh, or even in half an hour it is coming to 30. 
and these are very very suspicious of uh, giant cell arthritis and I think these patients immediately uh, I would tell them even if they came to me in the evening I would say go and eat something and take 60 milligram of prednisolone for the time being get the steroids going and then you can admit them and have the uh, uh, IV methyl prednisolone. I think about ESR that you said I very well remember yeah. that when I was working in the one acute emergency hospital in Perth, Royal Perth Hospital, yes. Australia. So there one of the indication for ESR testing, the only indication in ophthalmic department was if they suspect giant cell arthritis. Absolutely. Then, then in emergency you have to get it done, ESR and based on that as you said that within half an hour you get the result and you can... I would do the ESR right then and there. I mean I would take blood for other things but I want the ESR result immediately. Immediately, yes. Uh, the other things is the complete blood counts, the platelet count because thrombocytopenia can also be a feature of giant cell arthritis. Uh, I would uh, ask for uh, the C-reactive protein to be done and if possible uh, to really make a conclusive diagnosis is temporal artery biopsy. Start the treatment but within two, 48 hours you can schedule a temporal artery biopsy. That will help you. Yeah, that basically means if I remember is my teaching in neuroarthritis is not much as like you that temporal artery biopsy is diagnostic as well as curative, both it is supposed to be. Absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, I would really, I would not only diagnosis, I, I will use the, the word curative is important because you can really, this one situation, you may not be able to improve the vision in that particular eye, but you can do a lot of saving the other eye. Uh, by starting treatment early, recognizing the condition and starting treatment early. This is one of those things where we cannot sit, you have to jump up and get things going. It is, a, it is somewhere where the, one of those few conditions where the ophthalmologist can really make a difference to the patient's life. So it is here is your opportunity to get up and do something and this is where you should do it. So one question I would like to ask you that fluorescein angiography. Yes. Can we differentiate papilledema and pseudopapilledema? Yes, the, the classic uh, description is of course the leakage of the dye which happens in, uh, in papilledema uh, versus pseudopapilledema where there will there be no leakage at all. So there will be hyperfluorescence, little hyperfluorescence, bit, little yes, fuzzy yes. margin but it will not increase. It will not increase. In, not in due increase. course. Yeah, papilledema there would be leakage over time. Yes. Yeah. I think some more questions have come. Huh. Sir, I saw a patient, yeah. That I, uh, Abhinav okay. Kumar has said, Sir, I saw one patient, 47 year old male with HIV positive bilateral disc pallor, cause and management CT scan was normal. Um, well, HIV optic neuropathy can happen and HIV optic neuropathy can result in disc pallor. The treatment, uh, it all depends upon his visual thing, is, the, is, it, is it a progressive visual loss or is it some kind of a disc pallor due to an optic neuropathy which happened some time ago. So what you can do number one is I would probably the diagnosis of HIV has already been made, the patient is already on treatment possibly for HIV. So what are we going to do with the disc pallor right now? I think the important thing is to follow up the patient over time and see whether this disc pallor is resulting in progressive optic neuropathy, the vision dropping over time. If the vision is dropping over time then the big question comes is can we do something with steroids or not but before you touch any of these patients with steroids please do have a word with the person who is treating with the infectious disease specialist. This applies not only to HIV but also tuberculosis. Uh, and you really need, you cannot jump and start treating on your own, it needs a bit of coordination, you have to subsume your interests with the overall interests of the patient's health. Uh, so life comes first, sight comes next, so keep that principle in mind before we treat. Will a yes. recording of this no, webinar no, be sorry. available? Yeah, yeah, okay, the question by Vijaya, mm. will a recording of the webinar be available on AIO's website or with CIPLA? I missed the first half. Yes, definitely uh, ma'am, uh, it is always available. So maybe after two days or three days, you can uh, go to AIO's website, go to archives of webinar, you will be able to view it. So definitely please do that. And uh, one. Someone is Dr. Chintan. Dr. Chintan has asked is pallor greater than cupping equals neuro, cupping more than pallor equals glaucoma. I think by and large as a rule of thumb it works very very well. 
and Dr. Nayak is also deals with glaucoma. I think he should be able to tell us from the other side of the table. He is the cupping gentleman here. I am the parallel <laughs> person here. So I think as a matter of fact, overall it, it holds well. I remember a glaucoma colleague of mine uh, who was treating a patient with glaucoma but then found that the pallor was slowly increasing and then she referred it to me and there was a kind of a bitemporal flavor to the field defects and we, the patient eventually found to have a pituitary adenoma. So it does help, it does help. It may not work for each and every case but as a rule of thumb as a clinical guideline, yes. Uh, if you see pallor greater than cupping, it does merit further evaluation. It could be a space occupying lesion in the chiasm, it could be lack of circulation going to the optic nerve, you do a Doppler of your neck vessels. These are other things one needs to consider. I think it's rightly what he, Dr. Naveen said uh, about the pallor and the cupping because I also keep giving talk uh, about uh, is your glaucoma patient really a glaucometrist? Yes. So in that one of the statement which he also gave that bow tie type of optic atrophy yes. because usually glaucometrist optic atrophy starts at the pole upper or the lower, lower. pole. Mm. So if you see it as a temporal and nasal Definitely you can think of neurological rather than glaucometers and also this statement if pallor is extending beyond the cup on the neuroretinal rim most likely you are dealing with something neurological rather than glaucometers. Maybe yes. both but definitely uh, it's a worth uh, investigating from the angle of neurological. Uh, email ID Neurotrauma Sindhu has asked a question about how is temple artery biopsy done. Uh, I don't personally do, uh, do it Sindhu. Uh, but I do have my oculoplasty colleagues who do it for me. A uh, couple of important points to remember is you can take a fairly decent length of uh, temporal artery, nothing goes wrong uh, because it is important not to miss skip lesions in these because the areas which are affected might have normal areas of artery in between. So you need to have serial sections of the uh, temporal artery to be seen. On this particular note, I thought I would raise it since you raised it, uh, is what happens uh, if you have a right side arthritic AIO in suspicion, suspicion and you've done the ESR, it looks high, etc., you want to confirm and you do a temporal artery biopsy that side, you've taken a good length and you made the adequate section but it comes out normal. So in that case, what has been recommended is you do the temporal artery biopsy on the left side, okay. on the opposite side and you may find lesions there. But even if that side comes normal, then it's possibly time to revisit your diagnosis of giant cell arthritis because the chances of both sides temporal artery being absolutely normal is very very low as far as giant cell arthritis is concerned. Uh, it's, it's really not difficult because uh, when I was in Australia with the acute emergency hospital mm. there it was a usual procedure done by ophthalmologists. Yes, yes. Simply you have to just palpate it and if you somewhere if you see some nodules, nodules then definitely you try to take that, that area section. and just simply make a cut, ligate the arteries and cut it. It's very simple, it's not difficult at all. Not at all it's no. just question of doing once then you will be able to do it. But I must admit after coming back from there I have never done it. <laughs> so causes of non-glaucomatous cupping. So would you like to answer that? Causes of non-glaucomatous cupping. Vijaya has asked that question. Uh, yes, one of the, some of the things that he also pointed out that about the bow tie type of optic atrophy you must keep in mind yes. that uh, that means there will not be cupping but it will be primarily the optic atrophy. atrophy. So you get confused with that. The other thing which gives you this type of picture where you can about the uh, optic neuropathy, ischemic optic neuropathy, non-arteritic in late stages because if you follow it up serially yes. in the later stages probably you will see that simply it gives you suspicion that it is glaucomatous optic atrophy. Even in papilledema, if you follow up these patients over a period of time, maybe in two, three, four years down the line, this appearance will may give you appearance as if it's the glaucomatous optic atrophy but actually it is just the the sequelae of uh, disc edema and uh, he also pointed out about the meningioma, triad of meningioma yes. where you see some stereo shunt, 
the optical ciliary shunt. Optical shunt. ciliary shunt vessels yes. on the disc. Yes. This again means can give rise to appearance as if glaucomatous optic atrophy, but if you see the shunt, probably think of this condition also. And of course, sometimes some congenital condition also can. Yeah, I was thinking also of uh, large discs. Yes. Uh, generally present with large. Yes, discs. large discs. Yes, absolutely. Uh, optic disc pits uh, also look uh, can be confused with cupping. And I would also like to mention where pallor occurs along with cupping is when you have conditions like normal tension glaucomas uh, due to say carotid occlusions etc. Then you can get some element of pallor oh, along yes. with oh, what essentially is a glaucoma, an, uh, 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 an, an imbalance between the, the arterial perfusion pressure and the intraocular pressure. And of course, don't forget pituitary adenoma. That also can yes. give sometimes, confu can confuse you with the glaucomatous optic atrophy. In fact, I think that would probably be one of the most common yes. conditions where we would Absolutely. find where it is, didn't turn out to be glaucoma, it turned out to be, uh, it usually ends up being a pituitary adenoma. Yes, right, right, right. Abhinav Kumar has written in capital letters, thank you. So thank you very much for listening <laughs> to us, Abhinav. And to uh, all of you who uh, tuned in to this particular webinar. Ajay, now, now just one uh, Sunita. Yes. Has written, sir, we, ca we are not able to see hmm. previous webinars in archives. No, I think what I will suggest you just now, if you want to clarify, immediately ring up the office number, I will tell you, 011. You, are you noting down? 011-22-373701 and talk to Mr. Kripal right now. He will immediately solve what is the problem because it is available. It is available. So he will solve your problem. And for this, it doesn't need any password to log in. So you can definitely view it. So the number which I, again I am repeating 011-22-373701 and talk to Mr. Kripal. About the number of yeah, I think it's a, we had a good number of questions and since we don't see any uh, more number of questions, so with this assurance that definitely I will come back with another webinar on the treatment aspect of these conditions which is also equally important. But don't forget that uh, I just am forgetting the date, either 16th or 17th, whichever is the uh, 16th or uh, no, 10th. It yeah, 10th, 10th, sorry, 10th of November, there is going to be on talk on steroid treatment, immunosuppression, of course, that is also related in relation, primarily in relation to the uveitis. So that is also equally important because the steroid treatment do's and don'ts and what precautions you have to take. Just now as he was telling that you may never forget about the, inv the infective conditions yes. as well as tuberculosis. So those conditions when you are giving steroids on your own, so at least that webinar will be really helpful in that direction because it will be by ophthalmologists. So what precautions we have to take when you are treating patients with steroids or so various ocular conditions. Yeah. So I think with this we will uh, now Oh, fantastic. Someone again had, because these comments we like, we love to read again and again. Dr. Chintan has written excellent talk. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Dr. Naveen, for well, giving excellent talk. You're welcome, and Dr. Nayak, and thank you for giving me an opportunity. And thank you all for tuning in and listening. And uh, for all the questions that you ask, because uh, quite often uh, questions catch us unawares also. And yes, we try right. to do it less. <laughs> I hope I'll be able to answer your questions better next time, whichever ones I'm not able to answer clearly for you. But do keep in touch and uh, keep this activity going. And with that, thank you once again. So I think today means basically he has really given us a good idea that how to proceed whenever we get a patient of pseudopapilledema or papilledema or optic atrophy, that how to go ahead about it. And diagnosis, then the management part becomes much simpler and yes. at least a straightforward. Then we don't have to beat around the bush. So with these words, I thank once again thank and, and thank you all for watching and please give us your feedback and uh, any specific topic if you want, please suggest that. We will see if it is possible to include in future, definitely we will try to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you.